Uh, so thank you again for inviting me to chat today about the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan and how green campuses can help. I suppose the first thing to say is I think we all know that biodiversity loss is a huge problem. But biodiversity is such a complicated thing and you know it can be really hard to understand how as individuals or as organisations we can help deal with that. So I think what we really need is to identify simple vehicles that can be used to sell that biodiversity message to a very wide audience. And thankfully, pollinators are perfect for this. So pollinators are an element of biodiversity that people can understand and relate to. You can communicate about them as a really clean and simple message. You can easily monitor changes. And in protecting pollinators, you're also protecting biodiversity generally. Also, the plight of pollinators, unfortunately, is typical of, of many components of our biodiversity. In Ireland, we've got 99 bee species, 98 of those are wild bees, and of those, 98, one third are threatened with extinction. We also know that our common bumblebees are continuing to decline since we started measuring this back in 2012. So really, you know, there, there, there's huge issues there. Rare species disappearing because, you know, loss of semi-natural habitats, common species struggling because of the way that we're managing the rest of the landscape. So in Ireland, we have pollinator decline. In the National Biodiversity Data Centre, you know, we've been tracking that problem. In universities, and particularly in Trinity with, with Jane, um, you know, there's been research happening as to why it's and what are the best solutions. So I suppose at some point you have to implement the research and, and take action. So I think, you know, if you have a problem, what to do about it? Well, I think you have to decide if it's important, critically assess it and how serious it is. And I suppose that's what we were doing within the National Biodiversity Data Centre identify the causes. That's what Jane was doing in Trinity. So we decided, you know, we have to try to do something about this. So we came together and, and drafted an initial version of, of a strategy, which then evolved into the All Ireland's Pollinator Plan. So really it was about trying to agree a positive framework to address this problem going forward. We drafted initially and then developed by a 15 member steering group. It's identified 81 actions to try and make the island of Ireland more pollinator friendly again. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but really the core of it, it's about looking at the whole landscape. You know, it's about trying to make the entire landscape more pollinator friendly again. So what can we do on farmland? What can we do on public land? And what can we do on private land? Once we have the framework, you know, you're moving into this phase of, of, of telling people how it is that they can help. And I think it's really important that that research carries through this phase and that what we're saying you should do is evidence-based. So within the pollinator plan, we want it to be really clear on what we're asking people to do. And really the core message is if you want to help and everyone who has any responsibility for a piece of land, you know, from the smallest window box, the biggest farm to campuses, to schools, to gardens, everyone can help. And it's about thinking about whether your site, you know, however big or small it is, does it provide food, shelter and safety for our pollinators? And if you can take actions to provide that, you know, you're helping to protect biodiversity generally. So we want all the solutions to be evidence-based, as I said, and we also wanted to target them to, you know, to the right audience. So we've been producing these evidence-based guidelines um, since, since the plan launched in 2015. So we've got one for schools, one for farms, one for councils, local communities, businesses, gardens, faith communities, and transport corridors. So each time they're evidence-based, the relevant sector feeds in, and it's very much then tailored to that audience. You can get them all on pollinators.ie if, if, if you've not seen any of them. There's also a how-to guide series where we go through some of the more complicated actions. And there's also then a third series where we deal with sort of more specific sites, things like golf courses, sports clubs and so on. So this particular one, the one for local communities, was very much developed both with local communities and also campuses in mind. So what it has is lots of actions that you could take to help pollinators to help biodiversity, you know, on a campus or in a local community, you know, if you want to. And with these guidelines, we use a standardised format each time, you know, so it's always first about checking what you have already, you know, on, on, on so many sites, there's places that are already really good for pollinators. And the first thing you should always do is, you know, recognise those, protect them, preserve them. Then, you know, there might be areas where you can alter the frequency of mowing, pollinator friendly planting, providing nesting habitats, reducing the use of, of herbicides or insecticides, raising awareness and, and tracking progress. Mm. And I suppose what we find, and Stephen and Jean are going to talk in a lot more detail about this maybe, but there's different ways that campuses, I suppose, have engaged, you know, and, and there's there's no right or wrong way to do it. You know, the more actions you can take, take the better. And with these guidelines, we deliberately try to provide lots of choice. 
so that hopefully there's something for everyone, regardless of what type of campus you, you find yourself on. And I know that some campuses, this is just, you know, one from, from, w, from Waterford Institute of Technology, you know, they, they developed their own relatively simple document, but their own pollinator plan where they've gone through each of these and, you know, and they're deciding where they're going to alter the frequency of mowing or where they're going to have pollinator friendly planting. And that was something that they discussed and agreed, you know, with, with the ground staff. We wanted the information in the pollinator plan to be really easily accessible and free. So the website is the main way that we, that we try to do that. And hopefully on there, there's kind of standalone toolkits for anybody who does want to help. Just to say there's an awful lot of stuff on there. So probably the best place, if you're wondering exactly what there is, is to go into this resources tab. And then this table kind of gives you access to everything. You know, so there are also all the guideline documents, obviously, but there's also, you know, signage templates, um, flyers, um, posters, plants and codes, and, you know, all sorts of stuff but hopefully everything should be accessible from there. Just going back to this approach to implementation, I think when, you, when you've done all that, it's really important not to stop there. You have to track progress, you know, is what you're doing working? And when Jean and I started this, you know, we, we didn't just do it for the crack. We were trying to you know, do something that was actually gonna, gonna make a difference. So we've always felt that tracking progress is a huge part of it. You know, you can do that in various ways. The short term is it, having the plan itself, you know, those, there's 81 actions in it for this phase, they've largely been delivered, you know, which is fantastic and we're grateful to, you know, to all the partners who've supported it. Medium term <clears throat> is the food and shelter going back into the landscape. And then of course the long term, you know, this is only going to be a success if in the long term, if in 10, 20, 50, 100 years, there's more bumblebees, you know, there's more solitary bees, there's more hoverflies, there's more insects, you know, in, in our landscape. So we also track, you know, the changes in the pollinators themselves, largely through citizen science initiatives in the data centre at the minute. And as well as just to say, often the campus actions are focused there on returning food and shelter, you know, on actions that you take on your site. But you can also get involved in this tracking change of the pollinators themselves. And I know some campuses, I'm thinking UCD, for example, take part in the bumblebee monitoring scheme and they have a route around the campus where they, you know, take part, they count the number of bumblebees. That's really good for us because it lets us you know, it feeds into that national database that lets us look at trends, but also on a site basis, it shows them, you know, whether what they're doing is actually having a positive impact. Just going back to the, the medium term, then returning food and shelter to the landscape, we've also got this system which tracks that. It's called Actions for Pollinators. And in here, you can draw around your site and, and say what action it is that you've taken to help. And the idea with this is it gives recognition to people and also hopefully helps coordinate at local levels. So you can search by type, by type of action, you know, so you can just see whether it produces more or where, you know, produce pesticide use, see what's happening with it, you know, on the live charts at any time. And then, you know, here I've just got it to show me the campuses or headquarters that have been logged on at the minute. And you can click on any one of these and then get the detail behind it. So you can all see what everyone else is doing. Uh, just as those come towards the end, you know, the All Ireland Pollinator Plan for the, the first phase 2015 to 2020, it, it has been a, a huge success and we're really grateful to, you know, to everyone who's engaged with it. To mark the end of the first phase, we're going to release this kind of celebratory booklet, which has sort of got tales from the, from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. So lots of really positive stories across all sectors. Of, of things that people have done to help. And we, we've tried to pick things for this book that show a huge range of, of actions and types of things that people have done. And hopefully, you know, it, it'll be a positive way to mark the end of the first phase. It'll be available in January. So there's gonna be a new All Ireland Pollinator Plan for 2021 to 25. We want it to be more ambitious, but still remain realistic. We also, you know, want to critically review the success and the failures and build on those for the next five years. Next time there's going to be six objectives. <clears throat> it's more ambitious this time. There's 180 odd actions and responsibility for those that's shared out between about 60 key partners. It's been agreed, being discussed with those key partners, and then it will be available for a short review very early in the new year, and then hopefully published shortly after that. So just within objective two, which is making public land pollinator friendly, we've got a target there, 2.3, which is to make skills and educational properties more pollinator friendly. You know, in there, we've got an action, which is to encourage pollinator friendly management of third level campuses. And Green Campus, you know, have agreed it to, to the action. And I just want to say thank you to Green Campus, you know, for their ongoing support right from the start and, and, and they've committed again for the next phase. So we're, we're grateful to them for that. 
also a plan here maybe to explore the possibility of uh, some sort of campus annual award so people might have thoughts or comments or questions on that I think you know we find in other sectors you can't beat an award for for getting people to you know to do things so it, it, it might be a possibility here just again thank you to the campus partners so these are campuses who've signed up to support the plan in, in its first phase um, thank you to all of them we hope that, that individual campuses will consider partnering with the plan again. So it's what will happen in January is the, the draft new plan will be released. You'll be able to see it, what's being proposed, and then you'll be able to decide if it's something that, that, that you want to support again, if you want to become a general partner. Then there'll be a framework that you can sign and send back to us you know, to, to become a partner of the plan. Um, and, and you'll be able to tell us what you plan to do, whether it's help us promote the plan, you know, or make your site pollinator friendly or whatever it happens to be. So again, just, just to finish, I want to say thank you to Green Campus for your ongoing support. It's, it's hugely appreciated. Thank you to all the individual campuses who've helped so far. And, and you know, we're really looking forward to the next phase. And, and I know Stephen and Jean are going to give you examples of, of what they've been up to next. But again, thank you for inviting me and, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Stephen Seaman. I am the ground supervisor of the Manu campus. Um, first and foremost, thanks to Green Campus and, and Dara from Antashka for organising the event today. It's, uh, it's great to be able to uh, touch base with everybody, connect with everybody, uh, be it virtually and uh, kind of to share the message of what's kind of going on on, our, on the different campuses around the country. Um, so today I'll just be kind of briefly going over what we've been doing on the Manute campus um, over the last number of years. and. Uh, some of the actions that we have taken to make our uh, campus a bit more biodiversity friendly and uh, to, to transform it uh, into what it is today. So just a little bit about the background of the, the, the campus. Uh, the new campus is made up of two organisations. It's made up of um, St. Patrick's College Minute and um, Minute University. So we have two very unique landscapes, one being St. Patrick's College, being one of the oldest university campuses in the country, and also Minute University being one of the youngest campuses in the country. So we have um, a real variant of landscapes and uh, different aspects and challenges that we kind of have to face on a daily basis. So we have everything from highly manicured flower beds to formal lawns, woodlands. We have two water courses running through the campus. We have playing pitches. And we've all mature, uh, mature tree lines and um, new landscapes coming on stream every year when the campus is expanding and expanding. So uh, as you can imagine that this poses great challenges for us in terms of managing the campus, but uh, it also presents lots of opportunities for us to be able to do a few uh, kind of um, jobs, um, projects that uh, other, other sites would only dream about doing. Um, currently, there's about 12,000 students on the campus, and we have 181 acres that uh, myself and six other ground staff members uh, look after on a daily basis. So, just about what we've kind of been doing on the campus to try and make it a bit more bio biodiversity friendly um, for all manners of uh, everything from the wildflowers up to our mammals and our bees and our, our birds on campus um, we've we've gone on about a, a three-pronged approach in terms of what we're going to do to make the most get the most bang for our buck in terms of um, making the most biodiversity and friendly environment so first and foremost we looked at reducing um, aspects of our maintenance on the campus so we looked at reducing the amount of weed killer, pesticides, fertilizers that we had to use on the campus. We looked about reducing the amount of mowing and, um, and uh, la high labor areas that were not only thinking about biodiversity, but we're also thinking from a more sustainability point of view in terms of if we don't have to be using so many pesticides and herbicides or don't be running a, a lawnmower on it every week, it's going to bring our carbon footprint down um, much, much, much better. So, um, so that's the reduce aspect of it. We're looking at creating um, different environments for the for the um, for biodiversity. So this is when we're building new builds around the campus that we're choosing pollinator friendly plants, native virus trees, um, native virus hedgerows. Uh, choosing wildflower meadows over form over just grass lawns and um, picking 
picking the right landscape from day one is a, is a big aspect of where we're going forward in the next in the next couple of years. Um, and then the final and probably the most important uh, point is that we're kind of to pr protect and educate. So you can not only we're trying to protect what we have on the campus, but education is a big is a big part of what we're doing here on the campus. Is that we can do all these actions, but if we're not kind of sharing the word and educating the the next generations of environmentalists or ecologists and stuff like that, I'm t talking from not only third level students but any visitors or staff or children that come to the campus that we want to show best practices that they can take home or or share to to the next generation. Um, so this is just a, two pictures from um, from the past of what where we where we've come from. So these two pictures were taken in twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen, and they're two of my favourite pictures, which just shows how how far you can go in a such a short pace of time. So this is a common sight across the campus for many years. The picture on the left is uh, a picture that I took of me mowing the grass at the back of the park, where we intensely mowed it for. Um, every day, every week of the summer, and uh, it was tightly mown lawns, 100% grass coverage in most areas, a green desert we used to call it, um, and this was a common sight right across the campus. And then the picture of the right is more like something you'd see with the with coronavirus these days. But uh, that was a picture of me back in 2016 that I got a, a complaint in about spraying weed killer on the campus in 2016, and we used to spray over for vast amount of pesticides around the campus just to keep on top of weeds. And we were kind of just looking at our practices and we're just kind of saying, this is, this is just madness, not only from a labor point of view, but from a biodiversity point of view, it's, it's making the campus sterile. So we've gone and we've changed how we, we ripped up the rule book in terms of how we manage the campus. And we, we started off with six sites across the campus in 20, uh, 16, where we picked six locations across the campus in which we trialed the, um, in part, in, 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 given with the All Ireland Pollinator Plan and the National Biodiversity Data Centre, we kind of used them as, as our, our fuel to, um, to push these initiatives and what we tried to achieve. So we started off with six sites around the campus. Um, and as the years go on, I've scrapped the six sites and we've decided that the practices that were put in place in these six sites were so important that we rolled it out to the whole campus. So we have a wide ranging of um, don't mow, let it grow. We have sown wildflower meadows. Um, and this, these are a few of the pictures that kind of show the, what has come up from just literally letting, don't, don't, not cutting the grass. So this year we had a record number of uh, natural grass meadows with over 15 acres of uh, natural grass meadows sown uh, on the campus. And uh, we're looking to expand them next year because it's not only is it um, great for biodiversity, but it's our, our labor and um, maintenance costs are, are a fraction of what they were last year from, from in terms of managing them. Um, we've done sown wildflower meadow seeds, which are a high, high impact from um, with native Irish meadow seed, which are really great color impact. But we've kind of, as we go on, we're kind of f favoring the don't mow, let it grow approach as the, we're looking at the native um, seed bank, which is found in the soil, which is more sympathetic to the Kildare area. And we find that um, the pollinators that are more accustomed to Kildare would prefer the seeds that should be grown in Kildare. So out with the old and in, in with the new. Um, these are just a few of the other changes that we took uh, on the campus to um, promote um, pollinators and um, birds and biodiversity across the campus. Um, so in 2019, we stopped using all annual bedding plants and used her herbaceous alternatives. The picture to the, to the left there, you can see a before and after picture. Uh, the, 2018, the drought of 2018 was the final nail in the coffin for me in terms of the annual bedding that we were watering it constantly. It looked awful and it was just a sterile mess. So uh, we scrapped that in 20, 2018 and 2019, we planted herbaceous um, alternatives, which are a much longer flowering period. So we've much more forage for the, for the pollinators for a longer period of time. And our labor costs have been eff effectively halved in, 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 in the process. And I, I visually, I think it's actually more beautiful than the annual bedding has been. 
and then we've looked at other other um other aspects of our pots around the campus that were filled with our petunias begonias lobelias um, just to give high impact for our students, staff and visitors. And they looked lovely. They were, there's no denying it. They, they, they did look nice. But we just looked at these and we said they're, they're not providing enough um, forage for the, for the pollinators. So we switched them all out. And so all our plants, on, all our pots on campus are pollinator friendly planting schemes. And um, we feel that we've still achieved visual impact for, for, for the students and staff. But um, in terms of getting more interaction with uh, pollinators, I think it's been a big win. So um, if you build it, they will come. That this is something that we found that since we've been getting the, the campus right in terms of creating these wildflower meadows and creating um, more pollinator friendly flower beds and allowing our, our, our hedgerows to flower fruit and um, to be cut back on a less frequent basis, we're inviting nature back onto the campus. So this is everything from the, the, smallest, the smallest flowering plants to our bees, to our birds, to our, to our butterflies. And uh, it's, it's, it's been great to be able to see the, the interaction with the, the, the mammals and the birds coming back onto the campus. So like, like the housing crisis we have with, our, with humans at the moment, there's a housing crisis for, um, for our animals and, animals and plants and stuff like that. So we provided a few different helping hands um, to make the place more attractive to live. So we've put in some bat boxes, bird boxes, a peregrine falcon box into the spire, uh, just to give the, the, the birds and bees a bit more of a, a chance to survive on the campus. So, we, we lean heavily on um, educational practices on the campus and we've looked at running a few different events throughout the year. Uh, I just picked out three different um, uh, events that we ran to make it a bit more interactive for our students, staff and visitors to come. So we ran these free events to allow people to come and make a seed bomb um, demo which we got campus uh, compost from the campus and wildflower seeds and people were able to make their own seed bomb with native Irish wildflower meadow seed and they were able to bring home to their own garden. Hugely, huge, hugely um, popular and lots of people took it up. Similarly, we did something again earlier in the year was a solitary bee box making workshop where we allowed people to come and build their own solitary bee box making workshop all the timber was made from recycled pallets from the campus, uh, another kind of taken from a sustainability point of view. But again, over 100 people came to the campus, came to this li library foyer and built their own bee box and brought it home and put it in their garden. So not only are we keen to develop biodiversity on the campus, but we're also keen to stretch beyond the campus boundaries and to create multiple nesting sites and forage habitats beyond uh, Minute University campus. And then, and then another another aspect was um, was Gail Marr, who's a uh, part of our biodiversity community. She's the godmother of all the meadows on the campus here. Um, she's championed creating our first meadow here in 2015, and since that, we've been running. She's been running wildflower walks and uh, talks every summer, where people come along and, and have a look at the different flora and fauna on the campus. This picture here shows all the different flowering plants that she captured over her walks and talks in, in, in over the last the last number of years. Um, so the future of the campus, I mentioned previously, like it's with new builds coming on stream, we're, we have a seat at the table where we can choose the type of plants that we want in the new landscape. So we're choosing native Irish trees, we're choosing native Irish hedgerows, we're choosing wildflower meadows, we're choosing pollinator planting, planting schemes as the norm. So instead of being gifted these landscapes that we don't want, we're given these um, much more um, sympathetic landscapes to suit into the, the Kilsare setting. So with all this, we've, we've, we've received a few awards in the last number of years where, where biodiversity has leaned heavily. Um, first and foremost, back in 20, 2018, we, were, uh, we got our green campus flag. Um, uh, then in 2019, Again, biodiversity was very involved. Another team in, in was the green flag for parks, in which uh, we were the first third level institution in the Republic of Ireland to achieve that award. Uh, and then kind of the icing on the cake this year was from the National Biodiversity Data Centre and uh, green flag award, we were awarded overall winner of the Pollinator Award. And um, just to echo kind of what Una said there, like it's, it's um, 
to be able to have an award, to have an accolade, to be able to say that what you're doing is being noticed and being recognized, it really gives a uh, fire in the belly to improve yourself year on year and going forward. Um, as I say, all these uh, awards and accolades that we have to, for, for the grand campus at the moment, it just gives me a bigger stick to beat my boss with to be able to implement change on the campus and, and move forward in a positive way. So that's all for me, folks, and uh, thanks for your attention. And I hope to see you all on the new campus once this COVID all blows over. Great. Uh, thanks. And thanks, thanks for inviting me to speak today. And thanks to Una and uh, Stephen for, for their brilliant talks. And I think, Stephen, you're an absolute inspiration. I think the new campus is looking fabulous. So, so thank you for all of that. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about what we've been doing here in Trinity. Um, so uh, Trinity is a member of the um, uh, International uh, Sustainable Campus Networks and sustainability is a really key element of Trinity's strategic plan. Um, and you know, uh, Steve just Stephen just mentioned there. You know, you need to to get the top people on board, and, and the Provost of Trinity himself chairs an advisory committee on sustainability and low carbon living. Um, and being part of this international sustainable campus network provides this global forum to to support campuses and exchange of information, ideas, and best practice for for achieving sustainable campus operations and for integrating sustainability into research and teaching. So Trinity is really committed to, to this idea uh, of sustainability. Um, and within the campus sustainability plan, I guess in the past, things like energy, waste and water were really the traditional focuses and, and biodiversity may have been seen as either harder to tackle or something that's difficult to do on our uh, city centre campus. So you can see in the, uh, in the image here, this is um, a, a, an aerial view of Trinity campus. We're hemmed in by Dublin city centre, a relatively small campus, especially compared to, to Manu there. Um, but when you see this bird's eye view, you do look at it and think there's a lot of green space there. So we have a lot of green space right in the heart of the city. Um, traditionally, I guess it's been managed in quite a highly manicured way, in a very neat and tidy way, so that the campus is both um, attractive to the, the staff and the, the college community, the students, um, but also to visitors. So we get a lot of visitors to the campus. And so there's been a, a very much a focus on, on keeping the campus tidy. In our latest uh, sustainability strategy, we have three objectives to increase biodiversity, um, and this includes increasing the number of trees, includes increasing the amount of green space, and critically, and I think this is probably the most important objective, is increasing the biodiversity rich areas. And, and this is most significant because you, know, you can add trees, you can add green space, on their own they may not actually contribute a huge amount to our native biodiversity. We need to, to manage for increased biodiversity, for, for habitats, for, for species, um, diversity across the board. So I think this increasing biodiversity rich areas is, is probably one of, one of our most important objectives. And, and we've got a figure there of 5%. Um, it, it's, as I say, we're, we're very space constrained on our city centre campus. Um, and I think, you know, the next stage will be looking out to, to the other campuses and the sports grounds at Santry, etc. But one of the first things that we did uh, on the campus was to develop a campus pollinator plan. Um, and so this was launched in April 2017. So we, as Una mentioned, we launched the, the All Ireland pollinator plan in, in late 2015. Uh, it took me a little while to persuade, persuade the powers that be that we needed a campus version. Um, but then they did get on board. Uh, we launched our campus pollinator plan in April 2017. So there's the provost himself launching the plan. Um, there's Una Fitzpatrick uh, from the National Biodiversity Data Centre um, also with us there. So supporting the launch of the plan and importantly we also got the students involved so on the the left hand side of the photograph there are two students one zoology student one law student and on the right hand side of the photograph we got staff from uh, from non-biodiversity research areas um, involved in the campus pollinator plan and, and these these staff here um, Susie and Marcus uh, Marcus was in the biomedical area and Susie in uh, conservation in the library um, and they're both beekeepers so we launched the plan in 2017 and we really based it on the, the, um, the local community guidelines that Una mentioned in her talk earlier on. 
And so the first step in developing the, the campus pollinator plan was to look at the existing areas that are good for pollinators, both in terms of providing floral resources and for providing nest sites. Um, and so by identifying these areas, by pointing them out on the map, by showing them to uh, the, the ground staff and saying, you know, these are good areas for, for biodiversity and, and for pollinators in particular, then we can then try and to, to protect these areas, maintain them, or if they have to be modified, to replace them with the same or better quality habitat for biodiversity. In terms of reducing mowing, I mean, I think Stephen, you showed some amazing results from, from reducing the frequency of mowing on the Maynooth campus there. Um, I've had limited success in, in, in persuading Trinity to reduce mowing on the sports pitches, as you can imagine, um, and uh, a hard time convincing a, a reduction in mowing on the lawns at the front of college, again, because of this, this image and this, this neat and tidy and this, this idea that, that green um, is, is it looks better uh, than all this messy wildlife. But we have converted quite a few grassy areas on the campus now to wildflowers. Now, in this case, we didn't leave them to uh, regenerate. The, um, the picture on the left shows an area where we actually used wildflower turf. Um, so it's like rolling out a lawn, but you're rolling out a, a multi-species turf. Um, and this is this is this turf flowering this spring. So unfortunately, nobody got to see it because we were deep in lockdown, um, but, but it looked absolutely stunning. And then on the right hand side, we've got some areas where uh, clover, red and white clover mixtures are planted in. Um, and these are, are mown on a, a much less regular basis uh, than, than a, a regular lawn would have been. In terms of creating wildfire areas, one thing that we did um, over the last 12 months was to really run a, an awareness campaign alongside this um, creation of habitat. And so as part of an awareness raising, camp raising campaign with um, One Step Closer, we put out a poll to ask people whether they supported turning green lawns, in this case, very iconic green lawns right out the front gate of, of Trinity on, on College Green, um, whether people supported turning that into a wildflower area. And this got a lot of press um, and overwhelmingly positive response. So we had um, nearly 14,000 votes, 90% of uh, which were, were voting for change to these front lawns. And this really demonstrated the appetite for change and to bring biodiversity right into the city centre. So I'm just going to show you a very short video here. It's just two minutes. It was a video that was um, on the RTE news. I hope you can hear the sound. What we're doing. Apologies, sorry, cut John off mid flow there. Sorry, start again. What we're doing at the moment is removing the grass, nearly all of it's been removed, and we're replacing it with wildflowers. And we're doing that because of a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, the grass was in terrible condition and we're going to have to replace it anyway with something. And the question then was, well, what do we replace it with? Uh, and we thought that it would be better to replace it with something that increases biodiversity and also supports all island pollinator plan. We hope that this will be quite a bright and colourful area with things like oxeye daisy and uh, cowslip uh, and wild carrot coming up at different times. Um, so there will be a sequence of flowering and obviously that will offer the pollinating insects a menu that goes through the season. Uh, so hopefully it will increase the number of insects that we see in the centre of the city. That went ahead in February, March, and we got about almost 14,000 votes and 90% in favour of the wildflower meadow. I think we had expected maybe 60-70%, but to get 90% in favour was a, like a, a resounding endorsement for it. So it's clear that people are connected to nature, they haven't forgotten that, and they want to see some biodiversity, they want to see some more native landscape around uh, Trinity. 
you know, people might think that this area has always been under grass, but actually it probably hasn't. If you go back far enough, it probably was paved at one point. So why not try changing it again? It's going to be lovely. I think it'll be nice and green over the, the winter, but to see it next year when it is in full bloom, I think it's just going to be astounding. Okay, so I just wanted to, to show you that little video there just to, to describe uh, the, the, the project there at the front of college. Uh, and as well as the, the wildflower areas, um, there's been more pollinator friendly planting, um, both in, in the, the more obvious parts of college. So on, on the left here is, is um, uh, right in the, in the middle of, of the college, um, but also in the, in the less obvious areas. So on the right hand side, that's actually the entrance to the provost's house um, behind gates that none, none of us mere mortals usually get to peep. Um, and then the photo at the bottom there is actually um, the, the new business school. Um, and this has planting all the way um, up the, the internal wall facing into college. And in this planting are pollinator friends friendly species, plant species. And again, as part of the uh, increasing our pollinator friendly planting on, on campus, we wanted to get the, the community involved. So we had another online poll, another vote, and this time it was for, for spring bulbs. And we got people to, to vote for which bulbs they wanted to see on campus. And, and we also, you know, we, we use that as an opportunity to provide information about where those bulbs are from and what kinds of insects they might support at different times of year. Um, in terms of providing nesting habitat, uh, we found good ground nesting habitat, which we, we protected, uh, ground, uh, habitat for ground nesting bees. We also installed some bee hotels for, for cavity nesting bees. Um, we do, I've included this photo here, we do have Apis mellifera, so honeybee colonies on, on the roof of one of the buildings. Uh, and I didn't add this here just you know, because honeybees need more nesting habitat, but by uh, research on honeybees and understanding how honeybees interact with the urban landscape and with other wild bees um, and, and by improving bee health we can help to improve all pollinator health. Um, in terms of pesticides, again, yeah, we've reduced the use of pesticides. Ground staff are following best practice and IPM, minimal use of herbicides, except on the sports grounds, um, which have a requirement for selective weed control um, because particular weeds can be a risk to players. So, for example, plantain is a slip risk to players uh, and needs to be controlled. But most areas are now hand weeded um, and we're developing a formal sustainable uh, pesticide use strategy. In terms of raising awareness, um, obviously we, we teach, I teach to undergraduate and postgraduate students about uh, pollinator decline and conservation and the All Island Pollinator Plan, but we've also teach beyond our sort of formal classes, uh, we've held workshops for local schools, so in conjunction with Science Gallery and the Trinity Access Programme. Um, we saw, we've also done lots of ad hoc school visit, visits, we've had these campus level votes for the bulbs and the wildflowers, uh, we have a blog called the Campus Buzz blog which is also um, what we call our rooftop honey is called Campus Buzz um, and, and part of this blog we had a competition to the public to, to name the queen bee, all of this just to, to raise awareness um, of uh, pollinators and of what we're doing to try and promote biodiversity in, in the city centre and beyond. As Una said, uh, another really important part of doing this is tracking what we're doing. So we've been logging Trinity's efforts annually on the, the um, Actions for Pollinators website that Una mentioned. Um, and we've actually increased the amount of pollinator friendly habitat massively over the last couple of years, even in this very small um, urban city centre site. So I think it just shows that, that something can be done everywhere. Everybody can do a little bit of something. So to, to summarise, I think there's a real appetite for change, um, even in the relatively formal grounds of Trinity campus, both in the public areas and in the areas that are a bit more hidden from view. Uh, we've installed um, other biodiversity measures. It's not just all about pollinators. We've installed swift boxes. The campus foxes are treated when they're sick. Uh, we're developing biodiversity maps and species lists that are, that are accessible to the public and the college community, again, to raise uh, awareness, but also to enable us to track change, to be able to keep an eye and report on changes to biodiversity on campus. 
And finally then, um, awareness raising at all levels is really important to get support from senior management, from the ground staff, from the staff and students of the college community, um, and to reach out wider beyond the college walls to, to the wider community, the visitors um, and the other users of the city, city centre in particular. So I'll leave it there and uh, thank you very much for having us speak today. Faruna, um, Hayuna, uh, how would you recommend that the campus tracks its progress in terms of measurable metrics? Should we be looking at the extent of suitable habitat or pollinator numbers, uh, for example, transects? Thanks, it's a really good question and I, I think the answer is probably it's good to do both of those. So it's great to track and I think both Stephen and Jane give totally inspiring talks and amazing to see what's happening. Um, it's good to track the amount of new habitat or the amount of biodiversity pollinator friendly habitat that's being created. I would say maybe just from a practical perspective, it's, I think it might be easier if you've got your own pollinator plan, you know, so we have decided, you know, that you're going to create X number of areas that are mown under a different regime or X number of areas with pollinator friendly planting, so that then you can show that being delivered. Sometimes it, it's easier, you know, to track progress that way. And then it is also really useful where you can help us track changes in the insects themselves. We have two citizen science schemes on this that we run through the National Biodiversity Data Centre. One is a really simple scheme called Flower Insect Timed Counts, where you watch a patch of flowers for 10 minutes and count the number of insects that visit. And by doing that repeatedly, you know, over weeks, months and years, you, you know, you, you can see change. And we've got a second scheme again, which is really important, which is the All-Ireland Bumblebee Monitoring Scheme. So again, having a, you know, a walk, it's a fixed street walk, you do it once a month, having one around a campus, particularly where you're passing through areas where you've made changes, is incredibly useful both nationally as i said but also for you at site level because you can see the changes in year upon year as they happen brilliant thanks um so i'm not sure who this one was directed at but if anyone wants to jump in um projects cost money any suggestions how you can get organizations to contribute that's a good question <laughs> I think, you know, the, um, getting people aware and enthused uh, about biodiversity can really help. So I think that's where the awareness raising of, of what you've got, what it's what it's delivering in terms of benefits. And I think that's something, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about urban biodiversity and how green spaces in cities can benefit um, people living in the city. So that, that's, an, that's another way to, to garner support. Um, and I think there's a lot of... Um, uh, industries, a lot of businesses uh, who are interested in doing something for biodiversity, um, who might be perhaps willing to invest um, or, or, you know, partnerships with with other organisations in the local area. Mm. There's lots of lots of different models. Una might have some better suggestions. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Gina. I was just going to say, I think it's interesting as well, and, and Stephen explained it really well. It, I think it's a different management. It's not necessarily a more expensive one. You know, and actually often it can lead to cost savings and probably, you know, you know Stephen would be better, better pleased to, to talk about that. But, you know, there's a lot you can do initially before, you know, just simply by changing the way you do things already. But you might want to say, Stephen. Yeah, like uh, just just one action that we took, like with COVID, we, we, we rolled out large uh, grass meadows on the campus and um, which historically we was costing us in excess of 20,000 euro a year to, to mow on a weekly basis. Um, and I got a cut and bailed for less than 2,000 euro this year. So like it, it, you just have to look at how you can save that. And it, it, it did come with a little bit of friction in terms of the decision that was made. And it's, it's, I, I say it at a lot of my talks and stuff like that. Just because something's been done for the last hundred years doesn't mean it's the right way of doing things. So um, sometimes you just have to step back and have a look and see, like, yeah, it might be costing this much to do this, but is it the right thing to be doing? And you kind of have to evaluate it that way. Um, as Peter is kind of alluding to funding can be tricky, but if you can show there's cost savings to be made, I think that's a that's a great weapon in your arsenal to show if you're saving money these actions are, are worth doing i think also Stephen, what you said earlier is if you create space for nature it, it will come so as you say it doesn't necessarily have to be something that costs you a lot of money absolutely yeah no it, it's um it's the biodiversity value 
uh, not a monetary value. Like that, that's sometimes that's not um, given enough appreciation, I suppose. Um, but I think times are turning. I think things are starting to change slowly. But. So for the next one, I think maybe Stephen, um, uh, wildflower meadows are a great resource. Just visit Castletown in midsummer. However, to keep them vibrant and reduce grass harvesting of grass in September is needed. Uh, it's getting a problem dealing with its disposal. Is it a viable alternative to cut and leave uh, risings as, mu as much? As yeah, so, so we've we've gone from, like I said, we had five or six small sites around the campus where it was viable for us to go and cut and collect all the, mul the, the clippings off it once a year. Um, now that we've kind of moved to the next level in terms of it's, it's a common practice on all aspects of the campus that it's not totally viable to cut the collecting, collect, collect, uh, clippings everywhere on campus. So we're doing a few trials to see um, what's the mulch v collect um, benefits or negative impacts. Uh, one thing that I'm kind of looking at is if, if you go to the sides of your roadways uh, along like country roads and stuff like that, where the council comes along once a year and they cut it with a flail, uh, flail, flail on the back of a tractor, and none of none of the clippings are collected there. Yet our hedgerows, our the sides of our roads in certain areas of the country are are thriving with wildflowers. So that's kind of my methodology behind um, mulching at this point in time, and um, because I know on a lot of sites it, there is a huge cost in terms of collecting the clippings, but watch this space we're, we're we're doing some trials here and we're going to see what's the best option and then there's another one for una um it was about urban an urban setting um just trying to find it here um if you are oh yeah hi una if there were three key actions that you wanted uh, to implement in an urban environment for a campus with no green space uh, what would it be uh um, and then just to use leverage to encourage council to sign up the pollinator plan. Yeah, yeah that's, a good, that's a good question as well. Um, I suppose I would say, first of all, like, you know, regardless of how you little green space, you know, you might still have planters and boxes and things and they can become pollinator friendly. But the three things that you could do, I think you're right, you know, trying to leverage the local council and, you know, indicate your support for, for actions that they're taking is really positive. You might also find that there are businesses in the area who, that you could approach. We've got a special framework for businesses within the All Ireland Pollinate Plan. There's, there's 280 odd companies that have signed up already. They commit to taking actions either on their own green space or funding something locally. So again, encouraging local businesses, you know, to get involved and maybe if they don't have green space, you know, they might fund something something locally with, with tidy transcripts or whatever. Um, the third thing is just to, to raise awareness. You know, most people, maybe they're in the campus, but they might be going home to a garden, you know, they might be going home to a farm or, or, or whatever. So just letting them know. We've got lots of little flyers and, you know, there's all the guideline documents for gardens and farms and so on. So loads and loads of information. So it's just maybe spreading that word and, and getting that out to people. Brilliant. Um, so uh, another question. Uh, keen to know if the wildflower seed slash plants used uh, were of Irish province or are they imports? I can come in on that one. We've an interesting kind of track record on the the wildflower meadows that we the planted ones that we had. We we've cut, we've done both. We've we we went about it wrong in the first aspect of our first wildflower meadow seed. We bought French seed in for our first wildflower meadow back in twenty fifteen. Um, and it was only afterwards that we realized that we should really be buying an Irish seed. The pollinators didn't really see much difference between a flower or as a flower to them. Uh, we didn't see the interaction change, but as best practice going forward, we're, we're choosing uh, native Irish um, seed from, from Irish suppliers because it's, uh, it's, it's more specific to the Irish landscape. I think maybe I'll come in there and answer it from, from the point of view of our wildflower turf. So they were all native Irish species um, and they were grown, the turfs were, were grown here as far as I'm aware. Um, and um, I'm, I think there may have been one or two in there that the seeds may have come in 
to grow the turf from Britain rather than from Ireland because they weren't available here. Um, the I suppose the the argument that I would put forward is that if 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 we were doing this in the middle of the countryside, <clears throat> then I'd absolutely want to have native provenance, local provenance um, wildflowers. Doing it here right in the middle of the city centre, um, surrounded by concrete, it probably isn't as crucial. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, and I, I certainly would, would advocate for native Irish provenance seed to be used in, in, in any kind of seed mixtures. Brilliant. So I'll go at last two questions. Um, um, is a baseline study of pollinators critical before starting the steps of the pollinator plant? My just answer it's not critical, but it's great to have it because then you can show progress. So start the minute you can, I always say. But yeah, it's really good to have a baseline study, obviously, just because you can, you can track your own progress. And, and then maybe I'll chip in and say, even if you haven't got a baseline study, do something anyway yeah. um, and start your baseline. Brilliant. And we'll finish up on last one. Um, I want to try and convince a large estate in my area to change some of their grounds to wild gardens and to reintroduce uh, their kitchen garden that used that once flourished on on the estate. Where can I find scientific research slash data to uh, back up any proposals? I might just say that all the guideline documents that we have, they're all evidence-based. So we've gone through scientific studies and pulled out things that are definitely going to work. So anything we are recommending is already evidenced and it's based on scientific studies, the kinds of work, you know, that Jean and other researchers have been involved in. So you can go there as a good place to start, but I don't know, Jean, if you want to. I was, I was going to say the other place to, to go is to think about studies that have shown the benefits of green space, the benefits of um, uh, exercise and gardening and, and all of those things, that, the, the benefits for human well-being. Um, and so there's, there's a fair bit of research out there now showing that there are physical and mental health benefits associated with uh, being in green space, using green space and, and associated with, with gardening uh, and those kind of community activities. So I, th I think I'd, I'd go there as well. Brilliant. So I, I just, I think we'll, we'll wrap up there. I want to say thanks again to Una, Stephen and Jane. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, thanks, Gary, for uh, your help in the background today. And uh, thanks to everyone who attended and for your questions and your comments. Uh, 